Yes. Great. I'm trying to figure out where to fit the, the side panel. Just give me one second. Okay, well, thank you, P. Lu, for the kind introduction and to the organizers for the invitation to speak as part of this workshop. It's really a great pleasure to speak about some recent work where we really focused on trying to push the limits of in vivo visualization of small structures and humans. In particular, I'll be focusing on some recent observations that I hope will convince you that we're bringing some certainty to the zone of uncertainty, which is more commonly referred to as the zone uncerta, and specifically how we're leveraging ultra high field MRI to this end. So I'll start with some of my own motivation. I, I'm clinically minded. Um, um, uh, I'm interested in, I'm a practicing stereotactic neurosurgery. And so I, I won't belabor the point, but, but we're very interested in putting small electrodes near targets of interest, such as the subthalamic nucleus, and applying focal electrical stimulation or other types of treatment to have a positive effect on patients who might need it. Um, and traditionally, these, these, uh, the way we've begun to approach these areas is with these classic histological atlases, like the Shelton Brand Atlas here on the left-hand side, and there's the STN. And the way to get there to start would be just a, a consensus coordinate based on the anterior and posterior commissure. And that gives us a, a kind of a general sense of where we need to go to apply that therapy, but obviously is imperfect for a number of reasons. And so the, the workflow leading up to surgery is we get MRIs beforehand, clinical grade. We do uh, planning on the workstation. Usually the day of surgery, we do a CT in a frame. Um, and then uh, ultimately, because of some uncertainty with regards to the actual targets, we have to rely on certain adjuncts like um, intraoperative physiology, performing the procedure awake, uh, microelectrode recording, potentially LFP to just give us a sense that we're in the right place. For the rest of this talk, I'll really hone in on one way in which we might improve this process, and that is uh, with the use of ultra high field MRI. And so here's a, a schematic of the way I like to usually describe this process, is you have a, a T2 uh, weighted scan in the coronal plane on the left side at standard field. This is a clinical scan that I've used before, 1.5T. Um, and then as you increase that B naught, that main magnetic field strength, you get at an at least linear increase in contrast and signal. So when we get to ultra high field at say seven Tesla, you're getting a two to four fold increase in contrast. And that contrast can be exploited in different ways. And one way is to bump up or boost that spatial resolution. And so here's a 7T MRI acquired um, on, at, in London, Ontario and Canada. If you zoom into our area of interest um, for this workshop, that you can clearly make out the subthalamic nucleus is separate from the substantia nigra below. You can make out the globus pallidus externus from the internus, and I hope it projects, but, and I can convince you that you can even see that accessory lamina within the globus pallidus internus. Um, there have been some perceived issues with going to 70. So as a clinician, as I, as I first entered this field, I was quite interested in feasibility issues and the, this issue of distortion or potential distortion. And uh, this has been uh, studied by a number of groups, including our own, but on the left from the University of Minnesota, they used a, a nice uh, simple uh, kind of regional analysis uh, of, of the brain overall and, and found distortions uh, close to the air tissue interfaces. So that's boxes eight and nine. We uh, performed the same type of analysis, but using a more focal type of analysis using voxel level morphometry, where we had patients scanned at both seven Tesla and standard field, and were able to identify essentially that same distribution of findings. So on a regional level, the temporal pole is more distorted, and as well as the uh, left frontal, uh, the bilateral frontal medial cortex, again, for the exact same reasons I described. But of importance is that most of the areas that we're interested in um, in the subcortex, like the traditional um, stereotactic targets, are not affected by uh, this level of distortion. And I'll move on to now um, use cases. And, and I don't need to spend a lot of time on this because uh, P. 
Pilu has already nicely outlined this, but there's certainly been a lot of work at looking at the benefits of going to high field. And here are some examples um, uh, from uh, 2012. Um, showing that these uh, T2 star images really help to enhance uh, that contrast in, in iron rich uh, structures in the basal ganglia. So the STN being highlighted here, as well as the substantia nigra. And beyond that, what's quite interesting is uh, the findings also recapitulate what is known from a histology perspective. For example, here's a, a pearl stain from Dormont, which stains iron. And we can see that um, the medial aspect of the STN has a higher iron content, which also uh, is linked with higher susceptibility on that, on that susceptibility map. And overall, uh, there's been um, a lot of these structures have been uh, well identified, um, a lot of them based on either being large structures or because of uh, iron rich uh, content. Um, and of course, today I'm focusing on a region that has um, received uh, so far, relatively less um, uh, study just because it's been elusive to, um, I guess, visualization using these more conventional methods. And, and the zona inserta is actually somewhere in this space between the red nucleus and the subthalamic nucleus on this particular slide. So I'll get, move back now into, into some background on the zona inserta itself. And so the zona inserta uh, was first described by August Farrell in uh, 1877. And his first comments, or one of his comments in this, in this treatise on brain anatomy that he wrote um, is that it is an immensely confusing area about which nothing can be said. And in, in the appendix of this large document, I, I believe this is, uh, this is I, I found this in the back of the document, but I believe this is the first representation of the zona inserta here. Uh, as a structure lateral to the red nucleus and below the thalamus. Um, and uh, this is a coronal section. Um, and of course, we all know Pharrell by, for other structures that he's helped identify, like the fields of Pharrell, which in fact are, are quite proximal and, and bound the zona inserta region. And it's quite telling that he thought of the zona inserta in this way, given how much uh, he has been able to provide in terms of insights on anatomy. Excuse me. Fast forward to present day and from a clinical standpoint, um, these zona inserta, particularly the caudal aspect has proven to be uh, a useful target for treating a central tremor. So here we have an arc, a normal Archimedes uh, spiral drawn by uh, a normal individual, but with uh, in the in the case of a central tremor, this is the type of pathology we were able to capture with this simple task. Uh, and targeting the caudal zone and serta, as well as other uh, deep brain regions, particularly the, the motor thalamus, uh, is quite effective for treating tremor. Um, and, but it should be of note that the caudal zone and serta itself is not targeted as a, a directly per se, but it, its location is inferred based on that relationship that I've already described, that relationship between the red nucleus and the subthalamic nucleus and using uh, uh, different numbers of lines and using uh, uh, some ratios, we're able to approximate uh, where we want to target within this region. And so actually some groups uh, prefer to call it the posterior subthalamic area, given it's behind the subthalamic nucleus, the PSA, uh, given that there's uh, some ambiguity as to what the true uh, therapeutic target is. And these CZI or PSA implantations, uh, at least from single center studies, um, seem to require comparatively reduced amplitude of stimulation compared to uh, other targets like the motor thalamus. Uh, in our own experience in London, Ontario, they tend to require, uh, from a current perspective, uh, like 1.5 to 2 milliamps, while the, the VIM or the ventrolateral posterior stimulation requires higher, like 3, 4 milliamps. And this may have some benefits for the patients because uh, they're not using as much of the battery and thus they don't require as many changes uh, of the IPG over, over time. What do we know about this region from a mesoscale or cytoarchitectonic level? Um, so while the zone inserta is a gray matter region. So here I'm showing a coronal section um, uh, through uh, the zone inserta region 
in a rhesus macaque. This is lateral here, this is medial. Uh, and the neurons in this area are very loosely arranged. So this is the, the ZI uh, centered. Uh, above the zone inserted dorsally is the thalamic fasciculus, which is also known as the H1 field of Farrell. Further superior is the ventral lateral thalamus. Okay. And then below the zona inserta is the lenticular fasciculus, which is also known as the H2 field of Farrell. And below that is the subthalamic nucleus and out lateral is the internal capsule. Um, and we also know based on uh, immunohistochemistry that it has a very diverse profile. And the, the, this is a schematic by Mitrofanis from 2005, uh, providing some estimate as to the sort of functional or at least cytoarchitectonic um, subsectors of the region uh, having uh, connections with auditory, some out of sensory, motor, limbic, and visual um, areas. So I think all this information provides us some clues as to how we might uh, begin to see the zona inserta. I mean, certainly we're, we, as can be appreciated from one of the slides I showed previously, there was, there's no um, iron content uh, that is very detectable in the zone in Serta, but because it's a gray matter region, it kind of suggests that we should be looking at certain other modalities to see this area more clearly. And so this brought, bring, brought us to our protocol uh, at the Western CFMM, and we, we used an MP2 rage and SA2 rage combination, and as well as getting a two, T2, T2 space so that we have both T1 map data and, and two T2 uh, weighted imaging as well. Um, we, uh, we first scanned 32 uh, normal controls. These are the details for the MR sequences. They're in the associated paper. And we also uh, got data from a replication a data set. This is uh, data from uh, Roy Host, who acquired this data during his doctoral studies um, in Maastricht. And in terms of uh, pre-processing, I won't uh, belabor the point, but um, I can get into this if people are interested. We have some bids apps uh, that perform the processing for us. Um, um, and they're available through the Alicon's um, GitHub uh, website. In terms of template creation, similar to what Malar has already mentioned, uh, we use uh, the ANTS multivariate template creation tool and we bootstrapped it over 10 iterations. I'm gonna take a small digression right now to get into uh, a sort of discussion uh, while I have this audience about how we evaluate the quality of subject to template registration. And it is relevant to this, but just bear with me for a few slides. And it's kind of serendipitous, but I think I used the exact same section as Pilu and I kind of forgot that, uh, and, and I, I didn't actually appreciate that I was uh, paying homage to a new house as well. But this is a, a mid-sagittal plane. So this is my schematic of this process. Um, and so we have a subject being warped into a template space. And there are different ways in, we, in which we can evaluate this quality uh, from a deformable registration perspective. So first we can use regions of interest. Um, you can use, for example, the corpus callosum and you can identify it or delineate it in each of these um, spaces, or you can use points. Um, and so these can be called point landmarks. And when you register these structures together, from an ROI perspective, you can get a measure of voxel overlap. It could be the Jacquard index or something else based on this. Uh, so it could be intersection over the union. And from, from a point-based uh, methodology, you get a registration area, which is, can be uh, Euclidean distance, simply the millimeter distance between the, the two points once they're in, in the same space. And I would say um, uh, one point I'd like to raise is just that um, because of how, uh, how kind of turnkey some of the algorithms that uh, Malar and many others have been developing over the number of years, it's quite easy to get ROI based voxel overlap. And so I think we've kind of, as a field in brain mapping, gone away from these sort of traditional classic point based ways of assessing about uh, registration. It's harder, it takes time. Uh, there's a manual step involved, at least for now. Um, but I'd like to just focus in on, on this concept of point-based landmarks. And so this is our approach to the problem. We created this workflow uh, for manual placement of 32 neuroanatomical landmarks. It takes trained raters around 20 to 40 minutes to place these. 
um, and I'm cycling through them on the top right here. And there are 10 midline points. The midline points can be shown on, again, on that new and who's um, uh, mid sagittal plane, uh, but they're also lateral points and they all will circumscribe the, the area of the subcortex. We intentionally developed this in a completely open way so that uh, uh, you can log on to the, you can go onto the website. There's a, there's a training module online and it's heavily inspired by classic stereotaxy, the concept in Talarac, uh, leading back to Talarac and even before that of, of looking at point-based uh, registration of, 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 of features. And we've recently been working on extensions to clinical grade data, as well as other species, including uh, the macaque. And uh, what I'd like to illustrate here is an example of how you might use this. So one way to assess the registration as you, as you move into a template space is you have uh, these standard ROIs, the pallidum, striatum, and, and thalamus uh, that are, have been segmented either manually or automatically in the individual subject space. And when you bring these together into the template space, you can look at the voxel overlap, which gives you a measure on the x-axis from zero to one. And we consider good voxel overlap to be generally around 0.7 or 0.75 and up. Um, what I'm hoping to illustrate here is that we also, in these same set of subjects, I looked at uh, this uh, registration error as measured by those points I just briefly went over. If you consider at least from a template creation perspective or, or uh, inter-subject registration perspective that two millimeters or more is, is uh, significant, uh, then you see that um, these metrics are much more uh, sensitive to focal misregistrations than obviously looking at an ROI alone. And, and this is not surprising probably to anybody here, but uh, there has not been, to my knowledge, a, a good tool for doing this uh, until recently. And this, this, is, this has been our approach to dealing with it. And so um, leading back to the template creation for the zone inserta project, um, again, looping through everything, we, 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 uh, we perform these annotations across all the subjects in the data set, the 70 T1, T1 uh, MP, MP2 range, those, those maps. And uh, we looked at overall registration error, and we can see that over the course of 10 bootstrap iterations that this registration error uh, seem to be plateauing at least to just under 1.5 millimeters across all of these anatomical fiducials. Um, of course, not surprisingly, if you just stick with linear registration alone, the registration error does not improve very much. And this is across all of the 32 fiducials. And you can see what I'm trying to illustrate here. It's a busy, busy slide, but, but what I'm trying to at least uh, draw to your attention is that certain features you can get actually sub millimeter uh, accuracy in registration. And our first two are the anterior and posterior commissure. And so, so when you have sub millimetric resolution like we have with the uh, MP2 range, you can actually achieve very high resolution placement of these. Uh, but there are other features that, uh, for example, uh, are more difficult to, to uh, localize. And so you have a uh, you have a kind of lower limit of how good you can register those features. But overall, uh, it's, it's providing us some quantitative confidence that our template is converging on something that is accurate. So with this in mind, um, we, we took our 32 subjects and um, created this bootstrap template. And what was quite nice is when you threshold these T1 maps into certain ranges, we took 1,000 to 2,000 milliseconds that there is a very, uh, they're highly similar with to uh, conventional stereotactic atlases like, like the Shelton brand here, this is plate 28. And I'll highlight, for example, that the, the medial thalamus is more uh, hyper intense or has a high longitudinal relaxation time um, relative to the more lateral aspects of the thalamus, but specifically in our area of interest that the zona inserta is a uh, relatively unmyelinated. I, I apologize; it's a bit small. Uh, it may you may it may not project, uh, depending um, on how this is working through Zoom. And and superior and and medial to this is the RAPRL, which is uh, the prelemniscal radiation. It's it's a different naming scheme in Shelton brand, but this is consistent with what we call the FCT. I've preferred to. I've personally been using more of the the Morel style naming scheme. 
Um, so I've, I've, I've tended to call this the FCT, at least for this uh, initial uh, work. And this is consistent with an area that is quite uh, well delineated on this template that has a lower relaxa uh, longitudinal relaxation time. And so if you then provide some, have, have a, a better sense of how to segment this, you can do this uh, for each section through or slice through this template space and provide uh, uh, and create a three dimensional reconstruction uh, of these structures. And uh, here we are. So this is, uh, to our knowledge, one of the first uh, uh, reconstructions in 3D, at least from in three dimensions and in, in, in isotropic uh, submillimeter data uh, of the zone in Serta. Uh, and that's highlighted in blue. This is a superior view and different views. And uh, on the more uh, caudal aspect of the zone in Serta, we are able to decouple the zone in Serta from the FCT. Um, and this is uh, important as I'll get into a few slides from now from a, from a neuromodulation perspective. But uh, it also gives us a sense of this sort of complexity of the shape. And, and, and as I move into the more rostral perspective, you see this sort of, it almost looks like a hand, um, but, but you'll see how this interdigitates with other surrounding white matter tracks. And here I focus in on the rostral zone inserter here because we have both T1 map and T2 weighted data in the same space for all of these subjects. Uh, again, we're, we're heavily reliant for, for the zone inserta uh, on, on comparisons with, uh, with the Schaltenbrand or myelin-based myelin, uh, uh, histological atlases. And here uh, we can make out, again, the zone inserter is relatively uh, unstained in these maps, but you have the H1 and H2 below. Um, and so this corresponds um, in these sections. We're actually not able to make out these features on the T2 weighted image. We actually get most of this information from the T1 map, but the STN is, is better appreciated on the T2 weighted images. So we're, it's this fusion, this multimodal fusion of, of, of submillimetric templates that allows us to really um, reconstruct all this information. And as we were doing this, we also appreciated that there was an, an area, and I'll step back a slide, that is unlabeled on Shelton Brand. And I'd, I'd be really happy to talk with any of the anonymous in the crowd about this, because I've looked at a few different uh, histological atlases, and this has been unlabeled. And there seems to be a, a little tear uh, in this area, um, and that separates it from the posterior medial uh, posterior hypothalamus. And so what we've done, uh, it hasn't been labeled, but what we think is actually happening is that the, the uh, H2 field is running through the zona inserta and that this is, we've called this part, uh, part of the rostral aspect of the zona inserta. But I'd be happy to hear uh, from other people who've spent time looking in this area. And again, just looking at these arrows point to the, the same sort of thing. Um, and in the T2 weighted image, there's this area of relative hypo intensity. And this, in, uh, this has been uh, in one previous study thought to uh, be the rostral zone in Serta. And that may be correct, but it actually more likely corresponds with the actual field of Farrell, um, or one of the field, this is the H2 field of Farrell. And so again, focusing now on the rostral aspect of the 3D reconstruction, we were able to uh, provide a 3D reconstruction of, of, of the entire uh, field of Farrell complex. Sorry about that. And, uh, and we've actually provide, provided labels of H1 and H2 as separate from the medial H fields, but just for simplicity and visualization, we've just shown it all as one here. And um, just moving on to um, T1 T1 relaxometry um, um, and so far, I've really focused on just the qualitative ability to, to visualize these structures. But here I'm looping through the 32 subjects, and you can appreciate the sort of diversity of anatomy, uh, asymmetry in the red nucleus or other structures. Um, uh, but we were able to propagate these labels and also individually label uh, these subjects as well. And when you look at uh, this, uh, this data, um, plot this data in each of these regions, you can see that there is a separation between in green what the what we consider the gray matter regions of interest, the zona inserta, and also separated into caudal and rostral perspectives, uh, or 
or, or uh, ROIs um, compared with in blue, the, the surrounding white matter tracts, including the FCT, uh, the lenticular fasciculus and the thalamic fasciculus, so H1 and H2, um, and also separate from the RN red nucleus and the sub, uh, subthalamic nucleus. And these differences were uh, statistically significant um, by Wilcox and rank some testing, um, a, suggesting that we're able to just by um, looking at interrogating the local T1 values alone separate these structures. And uh, in the replication data set, you can see that overall similar pattern. But of course, of note, uh, we've kept the y axis the same here. Um, the values themselves, the absolute T1 measurements are different in our replication data set. And this was, of course, this was a bit concerning to us when we were first looking at it. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll kind of just draw it. I, I'm happy to provide more information, but uh, Roy Host um, has uh, covered this in a, in a recent paper in NeuroImage, these sort of intersite variability issues. Um, and so it's really important to take uh, into account these sort of variations from one center to another, uh, depending on the type of T1 mapping protocol you're using. But um, we were able to replicate and find that these uh, differences were still statistically significant, even if the absolute number was different. Um, and uh, back to the concept of its relevance to DBS targeting. Um, we, in this data set, we had the advantage of having both uh, T2 weighted data as well as T1 map. So uh, we, what we decided to do, what we were curious about was looking at the conventional indirect targets. And here are two versions of it, uh, where again, as I showed earlier, that there's, we're just simply looking at the geometry and the ratios between these lines and the location of the STN and the RN. And these are two different ways to do the same thing when we're performing stereotaxy. Um, but because we had the advantage of also having this in the T1 map space, and again, this is just looking at the comparison with the uh, Shelton brand as well. But if we have, since these are in the exact same space, we can just uh, move over into the T1 map space. And this highlights that these areas seem to be at the boundary between the FCT and the zona and CERTA. And from a quantitative perspective, if you look at the distance of that point, uh, in each of the, we're working back in the individual space of each of these the, the subjects in the template. But the distance uh, of the target from the caudal zone on CERTA, at least in A, from, and also from FCT and B, is equidistant for this target zero one. So it's halfway between the caudal zo zone on CERTA and the FCT, while the target number two is, is actually closer to the FCT. Uh, and in general, with this dashed line representing more of the, um, the, the zona and CERTA uh, type of uh, intensity, we're seeing that both of them are, are kind of at this blended area between um, more gray uh, matter regions and, and, and white matter regions. And we've able to, been able to, in individual subjects, um, use this, have patients have this 7T uh, protocol beforehand and, and also recapitulate some of that information on an individual scale with somebody who has achieved therapeutic benefit, finding that it tends to, it's seeming to be at, at these boundary regions. And finally, um, as a, although we have the luxury of using 7T, it's always useful to consider how uh, other people might take advantage of this without a seven Tesla uh, magnet. And so, um, you can see some individual data at 7T and that even with 3T protocols, different types of T1 mapping protocols, that you can begin to see that there's this hyper intense region in the zone and CERTA area, even if they may be slightly more noisy and acquired at uh, uh, lower resolution. And we've also provided our, our 7T template space uh, registered into the MNI 2009B space. Uh, which and uh, and as well as our our atlas labels, which can be propagated between MNI templates, with some caveats, of course. So my overall summary here: well, we found that high resolution T1 mapping at 7T can be used to delineate the ZI from surrounding white matter tracts, the FCT, the fields of Forel. We derived in vivo estimates of the size, shape, location, and tissue characteristics of substructures of the ZI region. 
and the optimal target, at least from our simulations there, appear to be, appears to be more uh, to, to the FCT. And this is consistent with uh, other data from other groups. Uh, Andy Horn might mention some of his own uh, ventures into the field, but looking at connectomics, that the white matter seems to be uh, highly important uh, for stimulation in, in, in essential tremor. The significance of this is that um, we've been able to confirm observations previously only possible through histological evaluation, and that the ZI is not just a space between structures, but contains distinct morphological entities that should be considered separately, and provides a structural foundation for more precise functional and neuromodulatory investigation. I'd like to end off with some uh, recent work that is um, being prepared by Jason Kai, a, is a, who's a PhD student in working with uh, Ali Khan and myself. Uh, and, and one way we can use some of the labels that we've created is um, uh, as, as wayward points. So here, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're identifying the ANSA lenticularis by providing the two end nodes, the globus pallidus internus and the motor thalamus. But um, by providing the wayward uh, point of the thalamic fasciculus, the H1 field, that we're able to, in combination with uh, more data-driven uh, tractography methods like this cluster confidence index, be able to really get at the shape of the structure and capture it as separate from other white matter regions. And this is one way we think moving forward that this type of um, uh, structural, um, I guess, identification of, 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 of these small uh, brain structures can really help us moving forward uh, to, uh, to deal with um, and, and be able to capture uh, and look at white matter tracks that have been more challenging to, to, to identify so far. I have lots of people I acknowledge. I've mostly mentioned, uh, so particularly my co-authors and two of the papers that I've, I've mentioned today wouldn't have been possible without them and the funding sources uh, below as well. I'd be happy to welcome any questions and comments at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So let me.